Okie dokie. Marching forward with our study of inferential statistics, we find ourselves in this week's class discussing the t-test. The t-test used to be commonly referred to as students t-test. Now I used to think that it was called students t-test because it was created to torture students. Alas, I was later to discover that it was simply someone's name. Actually, it was someone's pseudonym. Here, let's go to the Wikipedia site for the student's t-test and learn a little about its history. As I have said before, statistics were developed for entirely practical and important reasons, as I said before, for gambling. It looks like the t-test was developed in the aid of the production of Guinness Stout, an alcoholic beverage for those of you who don't know. The t-test was introduced in 1908 by William Seeley Gossett, a chemist working at the Guinness Brewery. Student was his pen name. Aha! So, there we go. The secret of the t-test. Back to our presentation. In this podcast, we're going to be talking about the independent means t-test. How to do it. How to do it in Excel. Using the t-test using your amazing analysis tool pack and of course how to interpret all those numbers. We look again at our decision-making tree to decide what the most appropriate test is. T-tests are tests to compare means harkening back yet again to those measures of central tendency, which are the roots of all statistics. Salkine has titled this chapter T for Two. But what he makes reference to is not the little song T for Two, but is making reference to the number two. Which is right down here. T-tests are the test of two groups. Perhaps that is the hidden meaning in the use of the letter T for the T-test. Here is our decision-making tree. Are we examining relationships between variables or examining the difference between groups on one or more variables? So in t-tests, in this chapter, we're looking at different groups. So we're examining different groups. And then we have to ask the sub-question, are the participants being tested more than once? In independent samples t-test, the answer is going to be no. So how many groups do we have? If we have two groups, then we come down here and do our t-test for independent samples. If we have more than two groups, we've got some other stuff to do that we'll learn about later. <clears throat> like we saw in, chapter on, in the chapter on the z-test, the numerator at the top of, of this fraction compares the differences between two groups based on the mean. Now the denominator with all those lovely little math symbols residing beneath the horizontal line combines, compares the variance between the groups. But admittedly calculating a t-value is just a bit more complicated than the z-score. <clears throat> 
I would have to say that student, a.k.a. Gossett, must have been packing away the Guinness stout when he was working on calculating this one. So, let's go to the next slide and get some common English into the equation. When we break it all down, it becomes a little easier to read. So our T obtained value is equal to the mean for group 1 minus the mean for group 2 divided by the square root of the number of participants in group 1 minus 1 times the variance of group 1 plus the number in group 2 minus 1 times the variance in group 2. Is this all clear? Divided by the number in group 1, the number in group 2 minus 2. Whew! And all that stuff multiplied by the number of observations in group 1 and the number of observations in group 2 divided by the number of observations in group 1 multiplied by the number of observations in group 2. Simple? No. No. <laughs> it's not a question. That's a statement. It's not simple. Fortunately, Excel will make it simple for us. Well, reasonably simple anyway. Degrees of freedom. It's always a good idea to remind ourselves what we're talking about when we're talking about degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom, you will notice, will be slightly different between the t-test for independent samples and the t-test for dependent samples. And some of that difference will be around how we calculate the de degrees of freedom. What calculating a degree of freedom does for us is that it estimates drawing a sample from a population. And it is typically calculated by ca counting the number of cases or observations and subtracting one. In the case of the independent mean test, we subtract one for each group. Here is a chunk of data. Mostly you would never have your data chunked out like that. And the only reason I can imagine that the author does this is so that he can show all the data in a small textbook. Normally our data would be organized either in columns or rows when we're working in Excel. Okay, here is our familiar eight-step process that Saul Kine has laid out for us. First we state our null hypothesis and our research hypothesis. In the first case the hypothesis is that there is no difference and our research hypothesis is that there is a difference. Pretty simple. Step two is selecting a level of risk or the probability of committing a type 1 error, usually 0.05. Then you select the appropriate statistic by reviewing the decision-making tree, which we already have done. And since we are doing independent samples here, we know we are going to be doing an independent samples t-test. Then we compute the statistic called the attained value. Step five, we determine the value needed to reject the null hypothesis by looking at the appropriate table of critical values in a statistics book or online in, in table B2 in this textbook. Then finally, step six, we compare the obtained value and the critical value. <clears throat> and then finally, once we've obtained the value from the t-test and you know the critical value for your t-test, you have one of two choices. If the obtained value is larger than the critical value of the null hypothesis, it cannot be accepted. And in the case of number eight here, if just the opposite is true, if the obtained value is smaller than the critical value, 
then the most uh, then the null uh, hypothesis is the most attractive explanation. Now, if we take a little peek at table B2, we will see that we need to know a few things in order to use our table. Giving you a moment to open up your book to the back to table B2. First, we will need to know <clears throat> before going on is do we need to do a one-tailed or a two-tailed test? For a null hypothesis, we would almost always use a two-tailed test. Our research hypothesis, on the other hand, can be either a one-tailed or a two-tailed, depending on the context. So let's pick uh, a two-tailed test. Next, we need to know what our level of risk is, which we set earlier as 0.05. And then finally, we need to know the degrees of freedom, which are usually listed in tables and in journal articles and statistic books as DF. Then it becomes a sixth simple process of going down the appropriate degree of freedom column for the two-tailed test. When we get to the value that is either exactly matching our degree of freedom or is the first value above our degree of freedom within a range within the range our degree of freedom falls then we follow that row across to the column of our probability level the value found here is our critical value simple So here in slide 11, Salkine has written out our results of the t-test in a fashion that you would often see publicized in a journal. The results are written with an italicized t, which is followed by the value of the degrees of freedom in parentheses, which is set in subscript. The equal sign, then our obtained value, in this example, negative point zero point one four. Then the probability, which in this case is greater than 0 0.05, which is indicated by the right facing arrow, which is also called the right arrow. Similar to what we saw in chapter 10 when we took our look at z-scores, Excel has a t-test function, although it does not calculate an obtained value, but only the probability. This can be very helpful for those of you who are working with Macintosh computers and do not have the analysis tool pack. If you discover that your two groups are not different and you do not need to know your test statistic, then you can just stop right there. You know that your two groups are statistically the same. And conversely, if you calculate the probability and find that the two groups are different, then you can save your work and go find a Windows machine and you can calculate the test statistics in Excel by programming it or using the analysis tool pack. In this slide, we see two groups represented by columns in Excel. Using the t-test function is going to be easy. Type in the equal sign, followed by t period test, followed by your range of your first group, followed by the range of your second group, and then a number indicating the number of tails, either one or two. And finally, yet another number, 1, 2, or 3, depending on the type of test. For independent samples, being tested is going to be either a 2 or a 3. Here in slide 15 are the secret meetings of the uh, t-test.
it will be clearer when I um, show you this in um, uh, in Excel. Okay, these next three slides are um, of the analysis tool pack. I'll just show you those, um, and then we'll come back uh, and talk about this uh, particular table. All right, so here we have a look at my um, Microsoft Excel. Even though this may look like I'm on a Macintosh machine, I'm actually tunneled through the internet to a different machine to show you how to use the data analysis tool pack for teach tests. So without any further ado, um, we'll go ahead and show you how to do it for independent samples, assuming equal variance. So this is the example from chapter 11. So this is where we have two groups that, um, uh, as far as we know, they're, the, they're going to be the same group. They're going to be from the same population. So we've got a group of recyclers versus a group of trashers here. And we just select our range, starting with the uh, label. And then we select labels. We have no difference in the means that we have hypothesized, so we can either leave it blank or put a zero there. And then we'll just put our output range right over here beside where we're working so that we can we can look at it and, um, and then we'll click OK straighten it up a little bit clean up our um, clean up our values just a little bit where's my where's my numbers here should be right there. Oh, there it is, right there. Clean up my numbers a little bit, get it down to two decimal points. And what I have here is Excel output, which gives me my mean of 34.4, a variance of 218.7, uh, <clears throat> 48 degrees of freedom. And most important, Excel gives us our T statistic, which is negative 0 0.8, and then it gives our critical value, which is 1.68. So, um, and we think in absolutes here. We, we, we disregard the negative value for a second, and our critical value does not, our T statistic does not exceed our critical value. And so we're going to reject uh, the test. Uh, we can also see that it gives a probability score uh, on a one tail, um, which we're, we're not interested in. Oh, actually, I was looking at the critical value for, for one tail. The critical value for two, two tail down here is 2.01. So. Uh, negative 0 0.8 does not exceed that. We have a, a probability score of 0 0.93, um, which is a long ways from 0 0.05. Um, so our test is not significant. Our critical value is not significant. We would say there is no difference between these two groups.
Okay, the effect size is yet another level of rigor that one can apply to their t-test to assure the results are more meaningful. The effect size, also called Cohen's D, measures the magnitude of difference between the two groups. The effect size calculation relies on the standard deviation or the variance in its calculation. Therefore, the effect size is salient regardless of the size of your sample. The effect size <clears throat> does not have a table or a significance factor that goes with it. Somehow, through trial or error, I guess, they've decided on three ranges of magnitude. Anything from 0 to 0.2 is considered a small effect size. 0.2 to anything below 0.5 is a medium effect size and anything 0.5 and above is a large effect. The formula for calculating an effect size assuming the standard deviations and the variance are equal is a fairly easy formula. In Excel we know how to do averages or means and we know how to do a standard deviation. It becomes as simple as writing a formula for the effect size that, so that equals the mean of the first sample minus the mean of the second sample divided by the standard deviation of either sample. And it doesn't matter which sample we use in the standard deviation because we had assumed that they were of equal variance. When we cannot assume equal variances our calculation becomes a little bit more complex. However, it's not something that is outside the range of what we can do using Excel. In a moment I'll bring up a spreadsheet and we can see how we can do that. In this formula we can see that the numerator is the same as in the pr previous formula. The mean of the first sample minus the mean of the second sample. And the denominator is a little bit more complex. When I show you how to do an Excel, I will break it out into its respective parts. Or one can go to this website and use the effect calculator there, which I will show you when I am calculating effect sizes in Excel. All right. We know that we can make an effect size calculation by simply going to the website that uh, Dr. Becker, uh, Lee Becker, over at the Colorado Spring University of Colorado at Colorado Springs has given us, just by simply inserting our mean first group, mean of the second group, standard deviation of the first, standard deviation of the second, hitting the compute button and it will give us our scores. We can also do it, uh, uh, calculate the Cohen's D using the uh, T value with the degrees of freedom to compute that. So. Uh, <clears throat> Here's those same two values based on our recycling and trashing scores uh, where we have a mean of 34.4 for recycling, a mean of 34.8 for trashing, standard deviation of 14.79 and a standard deviation of 16.11 plus some change. Hit, when I hit compute I come up with a negative 0 0.023 effect size. Now, if we recall from our earlier work that our um, independent sample t-test was point, negative 0 0.08 t-score with 48 degrees of freedom. So I plugged that into the effect size calculator and came up with um, nearly the same score, a little bit smaller. So. Um, <clears throat> Of course, going to Becker's website is going to be much easier than calculating it in Excel. Uh, 
but you can calculate it in Excel because you have a formula here. You can just simply format Excel to do this formula. So <clears throat> let's start here with the more compl complicated example where we assume unequal variances. So we see our formula is if x size equals the mean of the first group minus the mean of the second group, which I put up here uh, in F2, average of that range and the average of that range, uh, uh, one minus the other. And that is divided by the square root of the um, uh, variance of the first sample plus the variance of the second sample divided by 2. So let's break that down. So variance of the first sample uh, uh, is 218.82. The variance of the second sample is 259.75. Adding those two together, variance of 1 and variance of 2 gives me 478.57. And then the whole denominator, whoop, come back here, the whole denominator, which is the square root of the variance 1 plus the variance 2, which is right here in, in F5, divided by 2. So I've, I've written that out to make it a little bit uh, easier, broken it, breaking it down. Then, then, I, then I can just simply calculate the effect size by uh, dividing the numerator, which is up here in F2, the, the mean minus the mean divided by all this garbage here on the bottom. And that's going to give me, which, I, which I've calculated in F6, which gives me the negative 0 0.0232. Very similar to what I get down here in, in Becker's website. So um, it tells me I did something right. Calculating unequal variances is, is not that much different and it's a whole lot simpler. Um, if, we, if we can assume we have an equal variance, um, we just simply take F2 again, which is the mean minus the mean, still going to be the same amount, and then we divide that by the uh, standard deviation of either group. We're assuming equal variance, so we can just use any standard deviation. So <clears throat> our standard deviation here uh, in the case of the recycle group um, is going to come up with a, an effect size of 0 0.024. Slightly larger effect size than we got over here using the trash group which is 0 0.022. So we can see that there is a slight bit of difference um, um, in these scores. Um, um, and um, uh, our more complicated formula where we assume equal variance is in effect just simply adding these two standard deviations together and dividing by two to get our same score. We can see where uh, we know that the formula for a standard deviation is simply uh, the variance squared. So um, uh, this formula could have actually been written a little bit easier. I, don't, I hate to have to tell you this all kind. So anyway, um, more precise score uh, uh, when we use it this way than when we use it this way. All right, that's enough on effect sizes. Chapter 12, more T for 2. T test for testing between the means of related groups, also called a paired T test. There's not a lot different between independent samples and dependent samples t-test. This chapter goes over when to use the dependent samples test and I will point out the differences between the independent and the dependent samples when they come up. Here is our decision-making tree again. Again we are examining the differences between groups on one or more variables. So we go down the pathway to the right. Then we are asked uh, 
I am explaining differences between groups on one or more variables. Are the participants being tested more than once? When we answer yes, and we will usually answer yes when we have some kind of test retest situation. The most common scenario that we see in social work is that when we have an intervention we want to test, so we will give all the participants a pretest, then we administer the intervention, and finally we administer a post test. Then we compare the pretest to the post test using a dependent samples or the paired samples t test. Slide four. The formula for calculating a paired samples t-test is about as complicated as the independent samples test, but it is a different test. <clears throat> Rather than relying on the means between the two groups, it uses the differences between the scores of the two samples. It can do this because the samples are paired. A quick note, with independent samples, there's no great need to keep your observations in any order. You just need to be sure that you keep them in the proper group. But when you have paired samples, it is imperative that you not only keep the scores in their proper columns, but you have to keep the pretest and the post-test scores linked together when you do your calculations. The formula, while not incredibly complex, has a couple of terms in there that can be confused one with the other. In the numerator, we have the sum of the differences between the groups. So that is a process of subtracting observation 1 from observation, <coughs> from one observation in the first case, and then going to the second case, subtracting observation from the second one, etc., and so on for all your cases. In our denominator, we can see that we have the square root symbol again, right there. That is nothing new. We also have an n minus 1. That one should be familiar. But we have two varieties of the sum of differences squared. On the left side of the fraction, the denominator, we have number of pairs represented by the letter n times the sigma sign which means which equals the sum and then an uppercase d squared to obtain that part of the value we take those differences that we have calculated and then square them and then sum them together then we multiply them by the number of cases then we subtract and again we can see a set of parentheses which tells us to calculate everything inside separately so we have the sum of the differences of the two groups sigma capital D, the same value that we see in the numerator that we then square. It is confusing. Later I will show you how to do that test statistic in, in Excel both by using the analysis tool pack and by pro programming Excel to do it. One area where the independent and dependent sample test differs is in the treatment of the number of cases. In the independent sample, the two samples were independent and therefore each case was independent. With independent samples t-test, you do not necessarily have to have the same size of group in each sample. That enables you to do to test the downtown mental health center with its 43 people in its group to your suburban center which has 29. But paired sample, as the name implies, has to have an equal number of cases. So if you have individuals who drop out from time one to time two, you will have to make a decision about what to do with those missing cases. 
Usually it means you will drop them. Here is the basic layout of what we do when we calculate the pre-test and post-test scores and what we mean by the differences between the groups and the different squares. So here we have a post-test, pre-test, post-test score. And then of course the difference is 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 four. So we 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 subtract um, uh, seven from three or three from seven and we get four. And um, so that so that is our difference. Um, There are cases where, where you'll see where the pretest is higher. Say somebody got a seven on their pretest and a four on their post-test, that score would be negative three. And while it will make a difference in our difference column, because uh, four plus three plus two plus three plus one plus four may equal, well, that doesn't equal 30. Um, there's a whole bunch of missing cases in there. Uh, that negative 3, when we add negative 3, it's just like subtracting 3. So it would be, uh, it would essentially cancel out this other 3 in our calculations. However, when we do the, um, um, the d squared, uh, negative 3 times negative 3, if you remember your mathematics correctly, will also be 9, just like positive 3. Okay, slides seven, eight, nine have us um, choosing the statistic and calculating the statistic and using the same process that we used earlier. <clears throat> when we write out a paired samples t-test, remember when we put our degrees of freedom in the parentheses beside the t that we are using the number of cases minus one not the number of observations minus two. Otherwise, everything is the same as the independent test. Excel has a t-test function that can calculate a probability score for paired samples as easy as they can for independent samples. And remember, it is the probability score, not your T statistic. Here we can see an Excel spreadsheet just begging for a paired samples t-test. The column headers say pre-test and post-test. and the formula is almost identical to what we saw in the example from chapter 11. As in the independent samples t-test, we select array 1, in this case it will be our pre-test, array 2, decide on how many tails we'll be testing, and typically if you have a pre-test and a post-test of an intervention, you'll have some theory that there's going to be some kind of change between the two groups. You should almost always choose a one-tailed test. And then finally, you need to choose the type of test. In this case, you would select the one, which is represents the paired t-test. Excel also has a t-distribution function which you can calculate the probability of a value occurring. Oh, I don't, although I don't know when you would have a t-value when you don't have access to the ability to calculate the probability. It's much easier to do in our tool pack, which I will demonstrate using Excel.